Um, I'm very pleased to be here and I'd like to thank Mandy from the Kenyan Institute and uh, Mona from the Educational Bookshop and uh, Daryl Tiffel for inviting me. Um, it's a really good opportunity for me to try out some ideas and get some feedback and I'm very looking forward to hearing what uh, Ingrid has to say um, because we've worked together in the past, I haven't seen her for a long time so it would be interesting to see how our ideas may have moved on uh, since that time. Um, what I, I, I'm, I've done a lot of research on, on UNRWA from a very long period. Um, I've worked with uh, UNRWA, uh, different UNRWA colleagues over, over, over time. And I've also worked with a number of NGOs and government uh, agencies. Um, but these ideas which I'm going to be presenting tonight are entirely my own ideas and independent from all the different research I've done in the past. They do not reflect the views of you know, either UNRWA or any government or any NGO. And I just really want to make, to make that absolutely clear before I proceed. I'm going to con uh, divide my talk into three main parts. I want to look at some of the regional changes that are having an impact on the way UNRWA will be delivering its services in the future. And then I want to focus on the situation in Palestine and then look at some of the specific uh, problems that UNRWA will have to uh, confront if it is to uh, continue to fulfill its mandate. Um, and then I'll make some concluding remarks about what perhaps the role of NGOs and the donor community uh, will be. I think one of the big uh, changes that we've witnessed in the last five years is the shift in the Middle East from what we call unipolarity to multipolarity, from basically the dominance of the United States in the region to the emergence of lots of other actors which are contesting the dominance of the United States. And we can see this particularly in the emergence of China as a global superpower and the way this has deflected the United States' attention away perhaps from the Middle East to the Pacific region. But it's also reflected in the involvement of Russia in many of the conflicts in the region uh, and in the conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran over the dominance of the Gulf, Gulf area and the wider uh, Arabian Peninsula. And then obviously the long-standing rivalry between Turkey and Israel over influence of the uh, Arab neighborhood. And all these events have coalesced and, and ended up and resulted in the fragmentation of, of Iraq and now of Syria. In Iraq, we've seen the transformation of a Sunni-dominated state to a Shia-dominated state. And in Syria, we've seen how the, the civil war has drawn in the diplomatic efforts, the arms, reconstruction concerns, all these, the, 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 the tragedy of that civil war has deflected attention away from the Palestinian issue. And I think for those of you who are perhaps uh, fairly new to the field, do not realize the significance of this change. If you were working in this area in the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you would, you would see the enorm enormity of this big change. The Palestine issue was the number one issue in the whole of the Middle East for decades. And now it is not the number one, one issue in the same way. It is uh, having to compete with the, 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 um, the displacement and the migration crisis as a result of the, the Syrian civil war. And this is a huge change in what's happening. And this has, have, has implications on policy makers and how, how people construct their budgets and how they uh, invest in, par in partnerships or in, in, uh, in personnel. So, in this situation, in this regional change, UNRWA is, uh, will be uh, obliged to operate in what is probably going to be a very fragmented Syrian state, with enclaves of, which will belong to one party or another, very little cohesion, lots of uh, 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 confusion about which, which is the legitimate state authority, which law will apply, lots of memorandums of understanding between different parties. It's going to be a very, very complex situation for UNRWA to operate. Similarly, how welcome 
I mean, the, the, the Syrian state has been very, very def um, uh, protective and, and uh, uh, been a guardian of the, the, the Palestinian uh, cause. And to many, ex and to ma to many Palestinians have associated themselves with the, the, the regime. How well received will Palestinians and UNRWA be in the rebel-held areas in the, in the future when they are seen as being of, on one side rather than the other? And also in the post-Civil War reconstruction, the expectations refugees may have of what will happen to Yarmouk and other places which have been absolutely destroyed, will, will the, the expectations be beyond the resources of UNRWA to fulfill them? because of the enormity of the damage that has, uh, has occurred. Another impact, perhaps, of these regional developments is the way that the Lebanese state institutions continue to, be, to dwindle and be weakened, with many other parties competing over the control over the, over the different parts of the, Le uh, the Lebanese state. And there's a, a greater resort to UNRWA services as a, a result, a greater dependency on UNRWA, when actually UNRWA is not able often has, does not have the capacity to meet those, those demands. So the regional order is changing considerably and placing huge demands on UNRWA and the way it has to respond. If I turn to focus on, on Palestine, there's so many issues to look at, but I will look at just two to give you a flavour of the complexity of the situation. The first one is the Gaza blockade. The role of UNRWA in Gaza has always been highly significant by virtue of the fact 71% of the population are refugees. There's no escaping the fact that that drives its role in, in, in Gaza. But its role has increased as a result of the non-recognition of the Hamas government and the in invasions in 2008, 9, 2012 and uh, 2014 and the boycott of the Hamas government and the, the blockade have pushed UNRWA in taking a greater and greater role and uh, giving it the sort of, it's the main uh, institution that is operating and working in the Gaza Strip. And this presents UNRWA with some very difficult political decisions to, to make. Because by default, by the necessity of the situation, by the decisions of the international community, UNRWA is emerging as the sort of the shadow government that runs the, runs the, the strip. It's a, it's a non-elected, it's kind of like a, don, a donor dictatorship. It, it isn't accountable to the people in the same way perhaps an elected government might be. And, in, and so it has all these sort of very uh, uh, important powers and funding uh, uh, capacities, which there's no other agency that can, has that similar amount uh, in, in Gaza. And in an emergency, this is perhaps acceptable to people as a temporary measure. But when it becomes a normal, when it becomes the normal state of play and continues for five, ten, maybe two more decades, we, do, we don't know exactly, it raises questions about the legitimacy of that kind of power in a situation like Gaza. And it puts UNRWA in a very, very difficult role in terms of managing people's expectations of what they, whether the, UNRWA's priorities will meet the, the same priorities uh, of, the, of the people who they are serving. And the other problem attached to this so it acts as a shadow government or a quasi-state uh, institution in, in Gaza. But uh, most states have what we call force projection. They have an army, they have militias, they have uh, perhaps an, a navy or an air force to project their, their force in order to protect their interests. And it's very clear that Gaza needs to have connections with the outside world. It needs to be open. It needs to be, have open borders and movements of people and, and, and uh, um, uh, of, of goods. And Gaza is, uh, and, and UNRWA is not in a position to, to enforce this. It does not have this forced projection. It has to rely on Israel, on Egypt, on other institutions. It, so all its achievements in Gaza are dependent on the goodwill of other actors. 
So this is this, this has both power, but not an ability to secure that uh, the, the fruits of that power. It cannot ensure that this will continue. The third problem it has in, in, in Gaza is that it is obliged to work within the rules set by both the Israeli government, some, to some extent the Egyptian government, but also the way that the international community ha has, uh, 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 has made arrangements over the financing of projects in Gaza. So it's become complicit in the blockade. It's not quite acting as uh, the, the willing jailer, but it's, it's going along with the rules. And this makes it, puts it in a difficult position in terms of its legitimacy in front of people. To what extent is it supporting by default, de facto acting as a, some sort of a, a corporation with, with, the, with the blockade. And the fourth issue is a more general issue about the delivery of services that UNRWA um, has across all its five areas of operations. If on, in, in Gaza it is obliged to uh, play this very significant role, this quasi-state role, this governmental role, the pressure on UNRWA by donors, host countries, other bodies to reduce services, whether it be in Lebanon or in Jordan or in the West Bank, is, is, no, is not convincing. Uh, UNRWA cannot provide services and privilege one sector and not another sector. It has to have a, a broad distribution of, of uh, services across the whole region. And by pushing UNRWA into this role of being the main state, the donor community has actually made it more difficult for UNRWA to create efficiencies and uh, reorganize some of its distribution in other, other parts, which they are often putting uh, UNRWA uh, under pressure for. So the Gaza blockade is providing some very serious uh, challenges to, to UNRWA and I see no uh, indication this is going to change in the next five or ten years. So it has, uh, has very important significance about the future of UNRWA and how it will operate and how it will be funded. And I will come to that a bit later. The second main issue I want to look at uh, under this section on looking at the, the, uh, of Palestine and how the changes in, in, the, um, in the Palestinian uh, arena are affecting UNRWA, is the way that the Palestinian state has been deferred for the near future, medium term at least. The failure of the Kerry Initiative in, in 2014 has really pushed the idea of a Palestinian state five, ten years, really five is too soon, ten years possibly, yeah? if there's ever going to be one, it's, going to, it's pushed it back at least ten years. And this has significance for UNRWA. Or anyone who's worked with the refugee situation knows that the, um, the creation of a Palestinian state is not the end of the refugee issue. The refugee issue is much greater than the creation of a Palestinian state. The refugee issue also includes restitution, return, property, uh, and, and compensation. And so it's only a partial step creating a Palestinian state. So it wasn't going to solve the, the, the issue. However, both operationally, financially, and in terms of providing a political horizon, it was an important prerequisite to uh, uh, attaining the, 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 the wider rights of, of the, the refugees. And if you do not have a Palestinian state alongside an Israeli state, well, however it's configured, what do you have? What is the alternative, and how does that affect uh, UNRWA? If you do not have a a Palestinian state, or if you have, and you have the, the, the likelihood of the PA, the PNA, having less and less funds because of the uncertainty about the future, and it's a, the, the PNA being, um, finding it more and more difficult to deliver the services that it originally was set up to do, you will get a, a swing back of refugees uh, starting to use UNRWA services more. 30% of the West Bank live in, uh, are refugees, and 30% of those refugees live in refugee camps. And there has been a drift away, and many of you know this, a drift away from accessing UNRWA services 
to accessing private or PNA services. But if the PNA is not in existence and the funding is starting to be wrapped up, there'll be a drift back to UNRWA, which will put even more strain on its uh, resources. And if you do not have a PA, and you have, do not have uh, an Israeli reoccupation or some sort of a, a international uh, um, custodianship, it's very likely to be the emergence of a sort of a fragmented West Bank, a kind of war, warlordism, Tulkam and Nablus and Kalkinia and Hebron, having their little uh, uh, um, strong leaders who will protect their interests. And uh, this will make it very difficult for UNRWA to operate uh, with all this, the lack of clarity, lack of consistency uh, acro across the, the West, West Bank. And finally, without a strong P PNA or a PA or a, pal a Palestinian leadership that uh, is achieving goals, there will be greater pressure on UNRWA to articulate the concerns of the refugees. If the PLO can't do it, if the PNA can't do it, who else will do it? And the, there will be an expectation that UNRWA will do it. And this is very problematic for UNRWA because it will be then trespassing on the territory of the leadership. And uh, it will be cause its, uh, its big problems as a result. And then finally, in the terms of the deferment of a Palestinian state, if there is not going to be a Palestinian state, how does this change the status of being a refugee? If in 10 years' time you're still a refugee after being a refugee for 60 years and you still have another 10 years, and then it's beyond that, maybe it's 20 years, you're still a refugee, does this change your status in any way? And I've, I've sort of looked into this a little bit. I, there's other people who are much more uh, expert on this to me. And it's very clear to me that refugee rights do not get eroded by the passage of time. Whether it's one year or 50 years or 70 years, your rights remain the same. But what does happen, and it's not the fault of international law or anything, what happens is that others, other people's rights start to enter into the equation. The, the stage starts to get crowded. There's more than your rights. And we can already see this happening in, in, the, uh, the, in the region. It's very difficult now to argue that Palestinian refugee rights are more important than the rights of Syrian refugees, for example. Not because they are less important, just because the, the financial demands on the people who will support them and the politicians are, the, are crowding in that space. So there's a kind of practical difficulty. So rights are not eroded, but rights lose their primacy when they are over the passage of time. And that's a, that's a problem of time, and it's, uh, uh, it doesn't work in favour of the Palestinian issue. So, in the last, ten minutes? No. Yeah. last section, I just want to look at four particular challenges, um, specific challenges about the program and or in, uh, the, the, the activities of, of, of UNRWA uh, in the light of this, this context I've described. The first one is the demographic issue. The, UNRWA's medium term strategy of 2016 to 2021 estimated that by 2021 there will be 6.46 million uh, Palestinian refugees. So that's a 17% increase over that period. If you take those figures and project again into the future, by 2030 there will be 8.5 million refugees. So in what is it, 16 years' time, you'll have double the amount of refugees. Um, as, you know, that's, people have a right to have children. It's not a problem. It's, uh, it's just the, 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 it, co it is an issue in terms of matching supply, matching the demand, and uh, how, we, how is UNRWA going to manage that? You'll need more teachers, more schools, more clinics, it's not, and it's not just the question of more of the same kinds of things. It's that the nature of the demographic is changing. People are aging. The, the kind of uh, attention you need to give to their, their, their aging is, is different. There are different needs that older people have 
from younger people. So you have these non-communicable diseases, which are a feature of, of, uh, of the, a the a aging, heart disease, diabetes, mental health, obesity, all these things which require a lot of specific, specific attention, which at the moment UNRWA is not set up to do. So for example, the last year's bill uh, expenditure on insulin alone for diabetes was $2 million. That's just one in one year. And they were able to ch achieve those savings by negotiating very hard with uh, a, gene um, a generic um, uh, supplier. Uh, it would have been much more if it had to go to the, uh, the original supplier. Um, so the demography is, is a, 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 a serious challenge. Um, and there are specific, within that, you can break down the demography and look at specific needs of different sectors. One particular sector, again, we need to look at is the role of uh, the, the issue of refugee youth. 50% of Palestinian refugees are under the age of 24. And by 2021, there'll be 1 million Palestinians between the age of 15 and 24. So that means an awful lot more jobs uh, available, perhaps more education. But the the, 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 real, the real issue is that the lack of opportunities um, as a result of, say, for example, the blockade in Gaza, the uh, lack of access to the labor market in Israel, um, the exclusion of um, Palestinians in Lebanon from the Lebanese labor market, and obviously the civil war in, 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 uh, in, in Syria, in addition to the fact that in the past, many refugees would be able to go to the Gulf, and the Gulf was able to absorb many of the younger people who are often educated in, in UNRWA schools. That's no longer the, the most, um, the, the easiest route. That's now more and more and more difficult. So not only is this a huge waste of talent, we've seen how talented Palestinian youth are. Uh, we saw how Hannah Haroub won the uh, Teacher of the Year Award in 2016. And um, who was that singer, pop idol singer? Uh, Asaf, Muhammad Asaf. He, um, he, he, won, he won the pop idol for 2015 or 2014. They're both people from UNRWA schools in Gaza. Okay, so you know, their ta talent, they're by the shed load in, in, uh, available. So it's a waste of talent, a uh, waste of people's potential, a waste of what they can give, contribute to the world. But it's also a very fertile breeding ground for recruitment to extremism. And there's a big fear that there's a, unless the, the youth are offered employment and authentic forms of training and education, some opportunities, there, there will be a severe destabilization of, of the Middle East. Uh, in a series of interviews I carried out earlier in the year, people described this as the ticking bomb. It's a question of time before this blows up. And it will blow up not just against UNRWA staff who will be seen as representatives of the people who have put them in this situation, but it will blow up uh, in the face of the host countries and the host governments as well. Um, the, the third major challenge is with this kind of growing alienation that many refugees feel about their future, and, and, and I mean, in, in general, there's a lot of satisfaction for the services that UNRWA deliver. And, it's, and I, I, don't, I want to emphasize that when I talk about challenges, I'm not talking about um, poor quality. I'm just talking about the difficulties of meeting some of the challenges in the world. There, but there's a, an alienation about the future. What is going to happen? And this new situation that I've been describing is creating additional problems for UNRWA. And UNRWA has tried very hard to, act, to reach out to, uh, in, in working with uh, re refugees in, in lots of ways. And maybe Ingrid will know more about this than, than me. Um, but you know, they have the, the youth parliaments and they have various youth fora and there's uh, engagement with the trade unions as much as possible. That's not a happy story, but uh, um, there, there is a lot of attempts to do that. 
And it certainly, if you read the medium-term strategy of, the, of, of UNRWA, they have put ref engagement with the refugee population as a se serious priority because they're very conscious that unless the refugee population are um, involved in some of the difficult decisions that will have to be taken in the future, there will be a very, uh, uh, it will be, it, the situation will be even worse. But one of the problems facing UNRWA, and it, it's not just UNRWA, it's any agency that part, um, it wants to engage in consultation and participation. Consultation, participation is sharing responsibility, it's sharing decision making, it's sharing power. It means you have to surrender a little bit of what you have in order to give other people a sense that this is an authentic engagement. Otherwise, they're just seen as cosmetic uh, things that you put on your brochures to show smiling refugees, uh, you know, talking uh, in a public forum. It has to be genuine. And sharing power is very difficult in a situation like in UNRWA, where they are mandated by the UN General Assembly and the funding comes from uh, international bodies. It doesn't come from uh, the people. So it's like there's almost a, a, a level to which they can engage in participation, but they can't go beyond that. And they need to go beyond that in order to uh, ensure that there's transparency and involvement in the decision making. And the final challenge is really probably the one that is um, uh, uh, giving the greatest concern at this moment in time uh, is that the model of funding for UNRWA does not work. For years and years, UNRWA has been going around the donors with a begging bowl, asking for money on a virtually an annual basis to try and um, uh, meet the, the, the needs of the refugee population. And to, um, it's, and, and, and to meet the, the, the programs that is, it's, it's set up. And there's always a shortfall. I think, was it last year, tw tw no, in 2015, the summer of 2015, it, it, it uh, had a dramatic um, shortage of, of, of money and was at the point of not being able to open the schools in, in September. And there was like, lots of emergency meetings around the world and enough money was sort of made available just to fill that gap. That problem has not gone away. The shortfall still remains because each year it, in, there's more demand and the income is slightly less. And what seems to be clear is that when UNRWA is actually able to work within certain budgets, that's not seen as a, um, a, a um, opportunity for some extra money to be spent on other projects, it's seen a, as a way for the donor community to give it less next time round. Uh, and that's uh, a, a big disincentive for UNRWA in, 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 its, in its work in that way. It needs to change the funding model. That's really urgent. It can't, if I, if I explain, the population's increasing, the, there's a deflection of power, uh, of, of tension towards uh, Syria, it's coming to a huge crisis, and it, the funding model will not work in the next coming years. It needs to change that quite drastically. It does it, UNRWA is trying to diversify, uh, looking for money from the Gulf states, from India, from well, Brazil before it went through this crisis, but uh, uh, from other states. But that is the, still the same funding model of trying to get just enough money to get through to the next year. There has to be a, a, a longer, more sustainable way of funding. If, if, there's, if there's UNRWA is going to exist for the next 10 or 15 years because of the political situation, it's, it needs to have a different way of, of being funded. And it would be much cheaper for the international community if a different funding model is created. So to find, sum up, um, UNRWA is often seen in the sort of broader humanitarian field and, and migration studies as a, an example of what not to do in terms of managing displaced people. It's, a, it's the route that the international community should not take, having these large num, uh, uh, staff and institutions and facilities permanently in place. 
and it's been it's been criticised for not uh, being part of that other approach, which is much more uh, working in through partnerships and uh, on an ad hoc basis with uh, uh, smaller groups uh, and more diversified uh, actors. But in the context of I've, I've shown of the failing states of the Middle East, whether it be Lebanon being weak, uh, Syria collapsing, Iraq in, in, in fragmented, uh, Gaza not being part of the world system anymore, in that kind of context of failing states, collapsing states, states which are not able to cope, UNRWA looks actually pretty good. It looks like it's working quite well. It's delivering services to 500,000 students in schools. Uh, it's in, uh, invested in an education program which has, uh, is an envy of many of uh, uh, countries with similar standards of living. It's, you can almost see it as it's more than just providing protection for Palestinian rights. It's a model of good governance in this situation. Quality services. And so, in a sense, you could turn it around and say, well, actually, this is a boom. This is an asset to the region. And it could be presented as a, 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 as a way of, of, of the, the region getting itself together and, and, and investing in human capital. So, my view is that UNRWA is here to stay because of these political situations. The next 15 years, there's no question of that. It needs a new funding model. And it somehow needs to negotiate this role where it reflects the voices of the refugees and their aspirations without replacing the leadership. It's a very tricky uh, balancing act to, to, um, uh, to uh, conduct, but that's what it is. And my question, therefore, to the donor and the diplomatic community, in some extent, UNRWA is the price tag of the lack of political process by, by the, the lack of political progress by the international community. If you do not make progress in the political field, this is what you have to pay for, and that's the bottom line. And my question to the donor community is what are you going to do about it? Thank you. I'm going to wait till the call to prayer finishes. Can I hold this thing in my hands? It's easier. Might want to wait till the call to prayer finishes. Okay. It's up to you then. <laughs> Continues, by the way. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mick. Uh, I was asked uh, to um, share some comments to basically uh, mix. Uh, uh, policy study, which is a paper uh, for DFID, uh, yeah, recommendations to DFID and ONAWA, right, uh, about how to deal with this uncertain future. Now, uh, I will try not to relate like too directly to this uh, paper and just like uh, pick up some of the issues that I uh, from a perspective of a human rights uh, person felt would be important to raise with both DFID and ONOWA uh, and which I felt were not uh, sufficiently addressed uh, at least in the study uh, itself. Now the first is more like a side comment uh, because there is so much talk about complexity in this region and I think it's important that we always remember and especially also policymakers remember that in fact they have a major responsibility with their past policy decisions for creating this complexity in the region. It's not something that just happened because there is something odd uh, or special with the people in this uh, region, but it's the result at least of poly foreign policy decisions back to 1947 and even earlier. So uh, uh, there is, uh, so the challenges and the complexity that Onawa will face in the future will also very much depend on what sort of policy decisions are taken by 
donors who are governments, states uh, that pursue their foreign policy in the region. And there is a point here which I felt uh, would have been useful to address in, in, in the paper because there is a lot of current debate uh, about it. This, uh, the problematic of uh, more and more embedding of humanitarian aid uh, in uh, political and milita military uh, interventions by states in the region. And there is a lot of concern about uh, this increasing trend, uh, not only because it contradicts humanitarian principles of uh, neutrality and, uh, and independence, but also because it, it has shown to limit the humanitarian space uh, for agencies to operate, and uh, it entails risks for aid workers and agencies like Onawa, for example. So maybe that is another, like, uh, another issue that uh, should be more uh, critically reflected as, as, we, as I see uh, we have this, the idea is we can, we can encourage our, our, our donors to contribute to Onawa by telling them that Onawa is a tool for their uh, um, promotion of their foreign policy interests in the region, there, there is a backside to this uh, that uh, is problematic and should be uh, reflected when we promote Onawa and, and encourage uh, donors to support Onawa for this uh, reason. Now, my main, my main comment um, is that I feel it is time uh, when we think about or when we uh, discuss ideas about how uh, to improve, maintain, improve the work of Onawa and its donors uh, for Palestinian refugees. It's time <coughs> to do so based on a normative uh, framework of international law, including IHL and human rights. And that's something I saw uh, was uh, quite missing in, 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 uh, in the presentation and also in the policy paper itself. And I think especially for donor governments, they, have, they need to hear this message. And um, there is in the study, I just found it like noteworthy, there is a reference to the important role of the EU because uh, it has been promoting the rule of law and, and uh, uh, legal principles in the region. But that's it. At the same time, there isn't really a, a, the same uh, legal framework uh, used in order to guide uh, recommendations, analysis and recommendations for, for the future. And maybe that's important because, uh, or definitely it is important because both yani, DFID as part of the British state and Onawa as a UN agency uh, are bound by this legal framework um, and have legal obligations that they need to be reminded of. Uh, even after Brexit. <laughs> now, uh, there are some examples of why this would be, uh, or, or what would be different if we would uh, um, approach challenges and ideas uh, for Onawa uh, based on a uh, IHL and human rights based uh, approach. Um, yeah, and it, one point, for example, would be uh, we, w we would see more clearly the challenges resulting from the fact that for its donors, Onawa's 
UNAWA is a tool for preserving political stability in the region. It has been like this, and the idea is it will continue to be uh, this tool, while at the same time people in the region, including UNAWA's beneficiaries, want change. People do not want the preservation of the dis dismal status, uh, status quo. Um, so there, there would be a need to recognize that in, in fact the people here in this region are seeking the same respect of human rights and dignity as people elsewhere and want change for this region. I don't see it is helpful to kind of like repeat this notion uh, as if people in the region were moved primarily by all sorts of ethno-religious identities. Uh, nowadays, Shia, Sunnah, in the past, it was uh, other labels that were used in order to, uh, yani in order to basically divide and rule people. It reminds very much of this, uh, uh, of the old divide and rule policy. And an agency like Onawa and its donors uh, would do better if they would approach people on the basis of them being people with the same human rights and the same kind of aspirations as other people. The second, a second point is, for example, that if we, if if our thinking is is guided by an IHL and human rights based approach, we see clearly that in connection with the so-called failed Palestinian state or two-state solution, which includes the blockade of uh, Gaza, Onawa and DFID do not face the options of a binational state or one and a half state or a confederation with Jordan. What, what we are facing, in, in fact, is a situation of uh, Israeli colonialism and apartheid including persecution and more forcible transfer of Palestinians. And if we do not recognize this fact uh, and, the, and, and, and discuss and, and identify ways for UNRWA to deal with this, challenge, with this challenge, we are missing a major point. Now, in fact, uh, uh, there is already, already we have a situation where Basically, all of the humanitarian uh, uh, agencies here, at least in the OPT, including also much of the diplomatic community, uh, are debating and trying to find ways to uh, yani prevent uh, further forcible displacement transfer of Palestinians. It's not that we do not have recognition of this situation, but uh, there are a lot of further issues that would have to be discussed in terms of uh, third state obligations in connection with such serious violations of international law. That, and these obligations apply to both, uh, to different uh, uh, states like the UK and to uh, ONAWA as a UN agency. Yes, also related, another issue that would come up is that uh, UNRWA in fact has been seeking to provide best possible health, education services and employment for Palestinian refugees almost since it's been established. Uh, and somehow we, we, we continue to think that more of the same uh, would somehow uh, uh, lead to the stability in the region or, or prevent uh, uh, what has been around now, prevent Palestine from becoming a stamp that is needed by the so-called Islamic State Daesh. Uh, um, and uh, we do not see that, in fact, uh, what, what leads or what is missing is that Palestinian refugees, when they, when they expect UNRWA to, 
to at least uh, protect the full set of rights, including the right of, re of return. Now, uh, there is nothing wrong with that, and it doesn't mean that this is a competition to Palestinian leadership or that this is somehow being the mouthpiece of the PLO or that we st uh, on our stops to be neutral. It is simply this is, uh, the, the, this is what is required on the basis of international law. Palestinian refugees simply have this, right? Like all other people, there is nothing special about it. And on our silence and efforts to kind of like evade uh, uh, dealing with the right of return of refugees is, uh, is, has been an issue for a long time that has been uh, problematic and has, uh, uh, and has caused this kind of like a, uh, alienation between the agency and uh, the refugee population and is also a cause of frustration for uh, people in the region in general. Palestine somehow stands for uh, or, or represents very much also the issue of the refugees and their right uh, to return. Yes, and related to that, and, and this, uh, this question about uh, what will be the status of the refugees if the situation continues as it is, there is no Palestinian state, there is uh, uh, no peace agreement. Um, I would say it is true that uh, this um, uh, the model of UNHCR, uh, which is very much about uh, individual persons being persecuted, becoming uh, refugees, and if after five years people are still refugees, they are already protracted, uh, uh, protracted refugee situation, uh, isn't really very useful for Palestinian refugees. But the alternative is not uh, is not some kind of like a, uh, indigenous uh, native people status uh, because the model the model for dealing with the Palestinian refugee situation or let's say the model which maybe is like the closest the most appropriate is the model of South Africa under apartheid and. Uh, in a situation where we have uh, apartheid uh, and forcible population transfer, these are um, serious violations of international law and, uh, and international crimes, there is no statute of limitation. Now, people, uh, refugees have a right to return as part of their right to reparation. And this right remains for example, in South Africa, if we look at post-South uh, uh, Africa, uh, people can claim land that was taken from them back to 1913. Uh, because simply, or if we look at Eastern Europe after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, we had property claims uh, going back many, many years and they have been dealt with. Now, it is true that uh, there, uh, it, it, it will not be easy to find practical solution. But if, if this, the entire energy of the international community plus funds that have been invested at least since the Oslo agreements and if not before into trying to think how to avoid uh, dealing with the rights of the refugees into the opposite, into trying to actually work on practical solutions based on rights, I think we would have made progress far beyond of where we are today.